Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sovereign Way Christian Church. If you are outside in the courtyard, please make your way on in. If you're out in the foyer, please come in and have a seat. We're going to begin worshiping the Lord this morning. And if you have tuned in online, thank you for joining us wherever you are at work or sick or out of town. Uh, we pray that you will be with us again soon. This morning, our elder intern, Carlos Pamplona, will be uh, preaching from John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 4 and verse 14, in which we are told that God himself, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and that he is the maker of all things. And so this morning, we're going to sing a few songs on the incarnation of Christ, so it might feel like we're singing a few Christmas songs, um, and that's why. We always want to uh, try to shape our service and our, our worship time around what the scripture is telling us and what God is telling us. So let's begin to praise the Lord this morning. Stand to your feet. Let us begin telling God how much we love him and we appreciate all that he has done for us in Jesus Christ.
was born to take on flesh to fully obey the father in our place so that dying on the cross our sins would be counted to him and he would suffer in our place he would be buried in a grave and risen again scripture says so that if, when we put our faith in christ his righteous perfect deeds will be transferred to us so that we may be reconciled to god church that is why christ came and was born we have a reason to celebrate, so greet each other with a smile, welcome each other, let each other know that you're loved, feel free to move around the room, and make everyone feel welcome. Church, let us resume worshiping the Lord in song this morning. The song is called The Word. And Jesus took on flesh and was crucified and buried and risen again so that everyone who believes in his name would have the right to be called a child of God.
is where life is found in the life giver. What's amazing about our, our God is he is the source of all life. And when he gives life, whether it be physical life or spiritual life, he has no less life in himself. Like when we give, we have less of what it is that we give. Not so when it comes to our God. He is the everlasting source of eternal life. And um, we're going to continue to worship him this morning as we sing Christmas Hallelujah.
Amen. Please be seated, church. We're going to continue worshiping the Lord this morning as we receive our offering. And so our ushers will be helping to pass around the baskets. And this is a part of our service for our members and those that may be regular attenders. If you're visiting with us, we don't expect you to contribute. Um, but this is the part where we support the gospel proclamation across our city, across our state, and, and across the globe where we support mission projects and, and things like that, as well as different mission organizations. And so um, please feel free to give members and attenders joyfully, cheerfully, as God has blessed you. And as you're giving, please pray that God will use this to further the gospel. And so you don't want to give... Uh, with an empty mind either. You want to give with a joyful heart, but a mind that is focused on why you're giving and what you're doing uh, with those finances. And uh, we pray that God will do that. Um, we're going to continue singing one more song. This is called Lead Me to the Cross. And uh, this is uh, just a beautiful song. And again, just focusing on this idea that the word became flesh. The second uh, or third verse of the song is, You were as I, talking about the Lord Jesus. You were as I, tempted and tried human, right? In the flesh, Christ was tempted and tried just like we were. The word became flesh. He bore our sin and death, and now he's risen. So let us sing this song to the Lord.
make that our prayer this morning, that the Lord will lead us to the cross. Keep that in mind as we hear again about the sermon this morning from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 and verse 14, that the Lord became flesh, the word, and dwelt among us. Our maker and our creator came to us. Brother Ronnie is going to bring some announcements this morning. Again, this is still part of our worship service because in hearing these announcements, we are hearing how we can gather together this week to know God better, to study his word more. We're hearing who we can pray for to know the gospel. Um, we're we're going to have our corporate prayer. So this is all part of our worship of God this morning. So thank you, brother, for leading us in prayer and letting us know who we can pray for. Of course. Of course. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Uh, good morning and welcome to all those of you uh, visiting. Uh, it's good to see so many filled seats, filled parking lot outside. Um, just as a reminder, um, maybe this is your first time. So this is, uh, I guess, in that case, not a reminder, just to let you know, there's a card on the back of each chair. Uh, well, a couple of things. There's a, so obviously there's a prayer request card. Feel free to fill that out if you'd like, um, if you need prayer for any particular thing. But also, um, if you wouldn't mind sharing some information with us. So if you're interested in um, what all the, the church has going on as far as ministries, uh, we can reach you via email or, or whatever communication you choose to, to allow us to, to have there. And... Um, you know, it, as you're making your exit, maybe you haven't stopped by the welcome booth, but uh, stop by and speak to the, the people back there. A lovely couple we have. Um, the, the Alvas are back there today, so they'll, they'll definitely be uh, very uh, helpful and can give you any information or answer any, any questions you may have um, and keep you just in, in the loop in that way. Um, also, for those of us that are members, uh, just, you know, the newsletter. The newsletter is, uh, is the blood life here. Uh, it keeps us informed uh, as to what's going on. Just quickly, I'll, I'll mention that this week, uh, let's see, we have um, Tuesday, typically, check the newsletter for the dates on the Tuesday group, but we have Wednesday night, uh, Wednesday midweek service at 6.30. We also have a youth group that meets uh, on Wednesday nights, uh, Anchored Youth Ministry, uh, just across the courtyard here. Thursday, small group, we have a small group on Thursday, and our men's Bible study uh, group is back at it again this, this Friday at 6.30, again, here on campus. And um, this is a couple weeks out, but I, I'll mention it now because it tends to just kind of creep up on us. But the women's breakfast, so ladies, if you're interested, um, it's the first Saturday of every month. So that means we're already at the end of May, uh, right? That, that happened ra rather quickly. And so in two weeks, in two Saturdays, uh, the women's breakfast, first Saturday of every month. So just keep that, keep that in mind there. We have a custom here at Sovereign Way to pray for, oh, and um, those involved in the children's ministry, please check your emails. There should, uh, you should have received a new schedule uh, that going up till from June to September. Um, and of course, of course, if anyone is interested still in, in volunteering, getting involved, helping out in any way uh, with children's ministry, you could talk to, um, again, ask back there at the welcome booth, but definitely, uh, you know, Anthony, myself, Pastor Josh. Any of us that, that are involved, we can get you uh, some information as far as that's concerned. Um, at Sovereign Way, we have a um, custom of praying for a unreached people group from, from uh, some part of the world. Unreached meaning um, they don't have the gospel accessible to them in, in their language or uh, geographically. There's not a church in their area or uh, there just isn't a, an active, again, not an active church or an active ministry going out to them right as of, as of right now. 
but so there, so there are several of those groups that we are aware of. The group that we are uh, going to pray for here momentarily hails from uh, Japan. This group is the uh, Bura, Bura, Burakumen. The Burakumen or Hamlet people, I'll give you a little bit of information, background on them. The Burakumen or Hamlet people descended as outcasts from Japan's feudal system. During the feudal days, the Burakumen were placed into two groups. The Ida, defiled ones, filthy commoners or the hen, uh, non-humans. The Ida held, uh, held jobs around death, revolving around death. The Hinnin group included ex-convicts, prostitutes, beggars, and low-level entertainers. This social group was the lowest of the low. The Emancipation Act of 1871 abolished the feudal system, but no laws were passed to end the discrimination against the Burakumen. While many Burakumen have uh, assimilated into Japanese culture, they still face some discrimination in marriage and in employment, with the prejudice being most pronounced in the western areas of Japan. Early Christian missionaries reached out to the Burakumen because of their uh, evident needs and persecution. During this time, some became followers of Christ, but as it stands right now, it's less than a less than a one percentage, point uh, five percent Christian. So let's um, keep this group in in prayer. As we, uh, if you if you would, please bow your heart with me. You'll hear, hear me referring to um, some of the words our, our Lord um, preached on the Sermon on the Mount. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for allowing us, first and foremost, to be here this morning together uh, with the family, the people of God, and perhaps with, with some that uh, will be, I pray, um, inducted into that family today or, or very, very soon. That is our, our heartfelt prayer to you, Lord God, our, our supplication that whoever comes here this morning, whoever comes here to hear your word would not leave the same, whether that's believer or unbeliever. Lord, your word says, as, as your son spoke, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one or, or uh, of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Lord, those are... As, you're, as we just hear those words, uh, I, I'm sure they struck the, the primary, the, the first audience as, diff, as hard or harder uh, than even us, but we can't take those things lightly. We can't take the fact that uh, your son entered into his own creation, the second person of the Trinity entered into his own creation. Um, as we heard and we sang, uh, there was no place for him. He was born in a manger. The world had no place for him, right? Yet, it was because he made a place for, he, he took place among us, that he tabernacled among us, that we are here gathered this morning. It is only because he did that, God, that we're able to be friends of yours, to be children, be sons, peacemakers, children of God. Lord, I pray for the Barak women who have faced all, historically all kinds of um, discrimination, all kinds of um, uh, just persecution and, and just out have been outcasts that have been um, just uh, thought of to be lowly treated as 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 despicable and inhuman people lo the lowest of the low and while Lord in in many instances the gospel presented to people and that's and that's that a state of life and that in that in that condition many times it, it, it reaches on fertile soil we know that there's there's bigger issues there. There's bigger issues than just discrimination, persecution, based on ethnicity, based on background. There's the issue of sin. And that's the, the equalizer here, is that we all have inherited this sin nature, and we all are sinners. And the Baruch Kuman, until they hear the saving message of, of Christ Jesus, the saving message of the one who spoke these words, that our righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, no one will be saved. No one can be saved. I pray your sheep among them, the Burakumen, would, would hear your word, that they would recognize their shepherd, that they would turn away from their sin, 
and while maybe outwardly they're, they're never really embraced or, or taken in by their culture, by the surrounding community, they may be a part of something much greater, which is the family of God. And that they are recognized and that they are uh, taken in by you, Lord, into your family, into your community, which is a much, much greater uh, community to belong to, much greater family to belong to. I pray for the Burakumen, but I also pray for those here in current uh, company, maybe those that don't know you, those that who have maybe heard the name of Jesus, unlike the Burakumen, maybe those who have gone to church before, this isn't their first time, but yet have never received the Lord, the incarnate Son of God in the flesh as their personal Lord and Savior. I pray that today that would change, God. I pray that your spirit would move in this, in this church today and that, that those people and, and all of us really would be convicted of our sin. Lord, forgive us of our sin. Forgive us for when we have exemplified or, or tried to at least demonstrate our, our righteousness outwardly, but our hearts are far from you. May we heed the message of our Lord Jesus Christ, again, calling us to a righteousness greater than that of the scribes and the Pharisees by living consistently, both in our outward appearances, outward life, and our inner life. And I pray today, Lord, again, that as we hear about your Son being incarnate, taking on flesh, going through all the things that uh, are common to man, that we would take heart that our Savior, our Savior is one that empathizes with us and that came into this world to, to save sinners like us, to, to save enemies of God, to turn them to friends, to turn them to children. I pray that for the Burakumen. I pray for that for those in, in our, in our, within earshot of this message today. We thank you again. We pray for open ears, open eyes, and uh, ears to hear, Lord God. In Jesus' name. Church, before um, our brother comes and preaches for us this morning, um, I'm going to give our communion warning. Even though we're taking communion near the end of the service, um, we're a little shorthanded today on pastoral staff. Uh, Pastor Steve is, um, is away on military duty, so please pray for him. And uh, Brother Brian is not feeling well this morning, so please pray for him. Uh, he was slated to do this. So I'm going to uh, give our communion warning now so that when uh, the elements are passed out, you'll know uh, what to do with those. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, so whoever eats the bread, referring to the communion bread, or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself in this way, and let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And that is why many are sick and ill among you, and have fallen asleep. If we properly judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned in this world. And so, real quick, in Corinthians, there were some divisions, there were some schisms, the body of Christ was being broken up, um, there were people that were being treated unfairly, uh, rich overlooking the poor, and gluttony, and all kinds of stuff, crazy things happening in, in God's family as they gathered together to eat. And so, um, there was a lot of sin, and so the Lord says, when you take communion, I mean, don't you have food at home if you're going to pig out and do that, right? When you come together, you're to recognize that, that this this communion thing is really about the body of Christ. This is the bread and the, the wine represents the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ for whom he died, the entire church. Do you recognize that this entire body has been purchased by Christ? So why are you divided? Why are you acting like there's different parts of you when there's not, when you're one? So this gospel that we take in picture form is to be taken by those who acknowledge that Christ saves his people. And if we are those people, we are to love one another, not be divided. And so therefore, we should examine ourselves to make sure that we aren't divided from our brothers and sisters in Christ, that there is unity. We are to make sure that we are confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord and that we believe in him and that we're following him as a disciple and not acting like the rest of the world, okay? So that is your warning to you that if you are living like the world and you are causing division in the church or if you are acting like an unbeliever, Please let communion pass by you, because if you partake of it, you might bring God's discipline on you. Rather, you should judge yourselves and discipline yourselves and 
repent of whatever sin is going on, that you may receive the Lord's cup and the bread in a worthy manner, recognizing that this is the people for whom God died. And if you aren't a Christian, just let the elements pass by you when they come by you at the end of service, okay? All right. With that said, Brother Carlos Pamplona, he's one of our elder interns. He is uh, training and uh, doing a lot of studying. He's, I think he's got a library with him in his hands right now. Um, he's going to read from all 16 books, all right? And he's going to bring us the word this morning. The songs that we sang all focused on the incarnation of Christ this morning. He's going to be preaching from John chapter 1, verses uh, 1 through 4 and verse 14, as you see on the screen. So let's, let's listen to what God has to say. Our Father speaks by his word. And so when we hear the word being read, that is God speaking, okay? So this is part of our worship. God, you are worth my attention. I love you, and I will listen to you, and I will believe what you tell me to believe, and I will do what you tell me to do, and I will act accordingly and be shaped. So as attentive listeners to the word of God, we are giving our worship to God in this moment. So brother, please bring us the word. May we hear God speak to us this morning. Amen? You might be asking why I brought this big old water bottle. It's, we're going to be here for a long time. I, 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 might, just, I might sprinkle you from here. I, or I might just get uh, thirsty. Well, I'll tell you why I'm going to use it here shortly. Uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you for giving me this opportunity once again to address you this morning. Um, if you're able to stand, please stand with me as we read God's word. We do have verses 1 through 4 and 14 that are going to be our primary text, but I want us to read 1 through 18, which consists of the entire prologue. Um, That'll give us an idea of what John is trying to do here. It says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, And yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave to them the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent, or the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This is the one whom I said, the one coming after me ranks ahead of me, because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The one and only Son, who is himself God and is at the Father's side, he has revealed him. Let's pray. Father in heaven. Thank you, Lord, that we can call you Father. Thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you sent your Son, Lord, not just during Christmas time when we think of Christmas at the end of the year, Lord, but that we would focus on the message of Christ coming every single day, Lord, every single moment, because we need him. He is the creator and sustainer, Lord. He holds everything together. He is the glue that holds not only eternity, but everything together. And so, Lord, hold us up, guide us, illumine our minds and our hearts, Help us see clearly what you want us to see, Lord. Help us live in a way that glorifies you, Lord. And Lord, give us uh, grace and truth to live in such a way that the world may see that we are your children, Lord. Guide us and be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the reason I brought this water bottle is because, not that I'm going to drink it, but, you know, if you think about it, it has a label on the outside. Right, it says crystal geyser natural alpine spring water. And it's clear, so it looks like water. So you would automatically be right, or assume to be right, if it was water. And if you were thirsty, you'd have to come get some water, or else you're gonna, you know, 
going to mess you up in the long run. But what is if you drank it after you started drinking it? I told you that and that was in water. It was bleach. Or maybe even salt water. So salt water is going to dehydrate you. So the only true thing, the only right thing you should be drinking is water. You need to have the right thing. So it doesn't matter what the label on the outside says, right? It matters what's inside the bottle, the contents. And that's true for us too as well. But primarily in speaking about Jesus, as we consider and focus on who the word is, we need to have the true Jesus. Because if you don't have the true Jesus, what do you have? Nothing. It's a matter of life and death. And it's the same thing too if you're thirsty in a desert, in the wilderness, and you come to a bottle thinking it's water and you drink poison, benzene, bleach, whatever it is, it's going to hurt you in the long run. You need to have the real deal. You need to have the real Jesus. And so there are many Jesus, if you will, that, ups, that stand next to Jesus, but you need to know the true Jesus because if you don't have him, you don't have life. So again, we need to consider those things. And I know I'm in the Gospel of John, but I want to take us real quick to Galatians. And Paul gives us a, a warning, an admonition early on, because even in his lifetime and even in his time, there are things going on, right? There are false Jesus, false gospels coming, and he warns that it's going to come. But even in his time, it's happening. So that's why it's so important to have right doctrine, right understanding, the right gospel. He says this in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and on. He says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there's another one, but that there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed, anathema. And we have said before and now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. He doesn't say it once. He says it twice. It marks the importance of what he's saying. You have to have the right gospel. Because if you don't have the right gospel, you're lost. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, knew, again, that many false prophets, false gospels, and false Jesus would come, that they would be preached. And like I said, in his time, heresy, false teachings were already on the rise. In the years to come, if you go fast forward, not very far, but a little bit fast forward, and even until now, we see during the time of um, 325, we see here Alexander and Alexandria um, in, in, uh, in Egypt. You see these false doctrines arising, and all of a sudden, that's happening again. And you have a guy named Arius who was a presbyter, a bishop, if you will, a leader in Alexandria, and he was uh, trained, but he believed some ideas. He got some ideas from Origen and then from Paul of Samosata and Lucian. And ideally, essentially, he took the logical conclusion of what Origen said, and he basically said, well, Jesus himself can't be God. He's a created being. He was a biblicist, meaning that he looked at the scriptures and he read them and he thought they were true. And so he argued his case. And hence, you have the Council of Nicaea in 325, where they come together over 300 bishops come together to discuss this issue of who is Jesus? Is he God in the flesh? Is he like God? Is he different from God? And they had three words, homoousias, which means of the same essence, heterousias, different essence, or homoousias, which is similar essence. Essentially, as they got together, more than 300 bishops got together, they talked about it, and obviously the scriptures teach, as we're going to see here and as we read in John, that Jesus is God. Scriptures clearly teaches this. And so we need to know that because it's very, very important that we know that. And as you fast forward even further on, even into our times, we see Islam teaching a very different Jesus. He's a prophet, but he's not God. Because that would violate Tawheed, the oneness of God. That God is one and he has no partners. That's to commit shirk, the unpartable sin. You have our friends who are Mormons who are teaching that Jesus is not just God. He's one of the gods, many gods, and a pantheon of gods. That's what they call henotheism. There's gods among gods. And so Jesus is not God. He's our elder brother. He's the brother of Satan. So there's, a, there's that particular Jesus. And he brings to you a different gospel, the gospel that was preached in the Americas. So we have another gospel. Interestingly enough, both of these gospels that come from Islam and from Mormonism were revealed by what? by angels. 
And didn't Paul already tell us that even if an angel comes and reveals a different gospel, let him be eternally condemned, right? They're blinded. And if you think about the notion and how angels work, well, what, what do angels do? They're messengers, right? That's what the word means in Hebrew and in Greek. They're messengers. And so good angels bring good messages, but bad angels bring bad messages, corrupting messages, lying messages. So we have that, and that's why Paul's warning us, and that's why it's so vital that we understand what John is telling us here about the nature and the identity of who Jesus is. And not only that, you also have your friends who come to your door by twos, and not just the, the Mormons, but also the Jehovah Witnesses, who come to your door and tell you Jesus is not God. Jesus is a God. He is the first creation of God. And they're modern-day Arians. And so it's the same thing that Arius believed. And again, you have to be very careful with that. If you're a new Christian, you have to be aware that these are the things that are going to come your way to try to distort the truth of the gospel. I remember when I became a new believer, I was working at Olive Garden. A very nice lady. I remember her name, and I still see her. Her name is Brenda. Very nice lady. Worked in the salad bar. And uh, I started talking to her, and she would tell me, oh, you're a Christian. I said, so what do you believe about Jesus? And I would tell her. And she would say, well, Jesus is not God. The Bible clearly teaches it. And if you're not careful, man, if, 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 not just for being stubborn. I mean, I'm Mexican, right? I grew up as a Mexican. I am a Mexican. And to be Mexican, <laughs> as if it's not obvious, right? I mean, with the beard, I might look a little Arabic. But, but if, you, uh, if, 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 you, if you consider that, you know, my mom and my dad would always say, I was born Mexican. I'm going to die Mexican. I was born Catholic. I'm going to die Catholic. I mean, that's just the tendency, right? So if, unless you're stubborn and you're fighting for the stubbornness sake, you're a little safe, but you're still not there. But you need to know the truth because if not, they will turn you into a pretzel and they will get you and you'll bite the bait. And so you got to be careful. I almost bit the bait. Thank God I had a lot of people around me praying and guiding me and, and helping me see that. And so those are things that we need to consider. So whether you're a young Christian uh, or a Christian that's been in the, in, the, in the faith for quite some time, make sure that you always know who Jesus is. That's the whole notion of apologetics. In fact, John's gospel is an apologetic. It's a reason for who Jesus is. He's telling us who Jesus is so that you know who he is, so you have hope. And in fact, we'll see that here shortly. So please be aware of who Jesus is. And this is what we're going to talk about today. Now, <clears throat> just something by way of introduction. We need to understand that when you read the Gospels, they're different from reading epistles, that is, letters. Those are different genres, right? Different ways of communication, different types of writing, whether they're music poetry, philosophy, you read this differently than a letter of Paul. So in order to understand this, that's why John gives us a prologue. But before we get to the prologue, I just want to give you the purpose for which John writes, and we'll get there soon. But John writes his gospel because he wants to tell us something. So what is he trying to tell his original audience, and what is he trying to tell us by default? He's going to share something really good with us, and that's the good news. Right? That's what gospel means. It means good news. So if somebody asks you, what does the gospel mean? It means good news. It's the word yonghelion, or what we get evangel, evangelism. It means a good message. And so it's good news. Now, why is it good news, though? That's very important to think about. We need good news, and you can appreciate the good news when you're confronted with what? With the bad news. It is only then that you can truly appreciate the good news when you have bad news a particular diagnosis. You're out of money and your car breaks down and you have a spring of water leak in the house and now you're like, what do you do? You know? So bad news, you need good news. And this is what Paul, what, what Paul does, but what John does here. He gives us the good news. We need rescuing. We're in dire need. We're united to Adam and Eve and therefore we're dead in sin. And God told Adam and Eve, the day that you eat of it, you shall die. And when sinful people come together, sinful people make sinful babies. And that's the fact of the matter, right? Like produces like. And so we're united to Adam, and therefore we're dead. We're dead on arrival. So unless you and I realize our predicament, we will not accept, we will not appreciate, we will not even see the value in the good news. And as I was saying a while ago, the good news of Jesus coming is not just for Christmas, not just for December 25th. It's for every single day. It's not for new believers. It's not just the entryway into the Christian faith. It's that which sustains you through and through. It's not that you get saved, it's that you get saved, you're getting saved, and you will be finally saved. It's all from beginning to end connected. It's only when a person who's on death row 
and they hear that they're gonna get clemency of pardon, that they actually see the benefit of this good news, right? And that's what we have. And this is what John tells us. He's telling us the good news because we're in dire need of saving. And in fact, in John chapter 20, I know we're beginning in chapter 1, but if you fast forward to chapter 20, he gives you the purpose for which he writes his gospel. And he writes this, he says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe, not just believe, but that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see? He's not just interested in telling you stories, not just telling you stories about the miracles, not the miracles in themselves, not just to satisfy our curiosity, because as we study the scriptures, one of the dangers that I, I think is that when we study the scriptures a lot, we can get cocky, if you will, right? Because we know more, and we have to be careful that there's two extremes. One extreme is not knowing enough and thinking you're pious, and you have faith that is not intellectual, and then having too much understanding and then you think you're better because you know more and that's a false sense too but we need to know so here john is telling us these miracles point to jesus they're telling you something about him you need to know this so that you can believe that jesus is the christ the messiah the son of god so that you may have what that you may have life that's the purpose for his writing right jesus is the christ the messiah the long-awaited anointed one i would you probably won't hear me ever uh, quote uh, Peterson's Bible, uh, the message, but there's a way that he says something in there in verse 14 that's pretty interesting. When it says that God dwelt with us, it literally says that God moved into the neighborhood, which is kind of an interesting way to think about it. But, you know, apart from other things, I think that's a good understanding of what it means that God came to be with us. He didn't just visit. He didn't just appear to be here. He literally was here. He moved in. And when we get to verse 14, we'll cover more of this. So we have here that Jesus himself not only happens to be the eternal son of God, but he happens to be God himself as well. Not the father, but of the same substance, same nature as the father, God in the flesh. And whoever believes in him shall have life. This is what John wants us to understand. This is what John wants us to know. That's his purpose. And so as we move, let's go back again I'm going to bring you back and forth. Like we're just boxing. I'm going to give you a jab. You're going to come back. You're going to go back and forth. So now we go to the prologue. We begin to the beginning. So John has a prologue. And it consists of chapters one, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. We just read them. So what's the function of a prologue? What begins the beginning? It's a beginning of beginnings, if you will. It's an appetizer, a taste of things to come. It's not only the entryway into the gospel of John, but it's the roadmap. It actually tells you what John wants you to see, what he wants you to understand. It's basically expanding. As you go through the chapters 1 through 20, you'll see what's in the prologue is essentially expanded and unpacked throughout the entirety of John's gospel. So again, it's introducing the major themes that John will deploy throughout. The prologue sets the tone. It foreshadows. It gives you the context and tells you what John wants you to know and keep in mind as you read the entire gospel. So for example, take these. He presents the themes like this. Here's a prologue, and then I'll give you in the gospel. The pre-existence of the Logos, the Son. You find that in chapter 1, verse 1 through 2, but then he unpacks it in 17.5. The Logos, the Son, chapter 1, verse 4, but he unpacks it in 5.26, the notion that there is life in him. He's rejected by darkness. You see it in 1.13, 3.6, 8.4, 42. Being born of God, not of the flesh, that's in 114, 18, but then you see that unpacked in 1241 and even in 36. Talks to Nicodemus in 36 about being born again. So these are different themes that you'll see unpacked throughout. So that's what it gives you in the prologue. So I would ask you this when you actually read the Gospel of John, you know, there's a saying that says any text out of context becomes a pretext. So you have to read it in context. But what you have to understand, too, with a, with a gospel narrative, you're not going to see a clear-cut line of argument as you do in Paul's letters. You're going to see stories that build upon stories that build upon stories. And John is trying to get you to be face-to-face -to -face with God, with Jesus. And so when you read the Gospel of John, go back to the prologue, read that prologue, and then as you're reading the Gospel, see how it expands, and that's telling you exactly what he wants you to know. So as we move on, John's main idea is going to be this in these verses, that 
the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, became flesh for our salvation. That's essentially what John is telling us here. The second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God, became flesh for our salvation. Now, I'm doing a lot of introduction, but just some things to think about. In the gospel, John's going to use various stories. Stories about what Jesus did, what he said, and how people responded to his message. The stories themselves are going to present dilemmas, symbolism, and opposing themes and ideas like darkness, light, life, death, truth. These are the things that John is doing. That's how you can understand this particular book. And then additionally, there's going to be the essence of grammar. I know that I don't want to sound like a language arts teacher right now, but we have to understand this because in verses 1 through 3, we're going to see uses of the word that are going to be very important for us. And so we see that in order to understand what he's saying, we've got to pay attention to the usage of words and to the order of words as well. That's going to help us understand so we can piece it together. With that being said, let's move into verses 1 through 2. And there it says again, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 2, in essence, kind of summarizes what we already saw in verse 1 and 2. So having read the sentence, what do you think is the subject of the sentence? In other words, what is the sentence about? The Word, right? And it tells us that in Greek, it shows us that that's the nominative, that's the sentence, that's the actual subject of the sentence. And so John is later going to identify that this word is Jesus, the eternal son. But for now, he wants us to focus on the word itself and the word who takes on human form. But the word at this moment in time, he's talking about, what does he say? In the beginning was the word. Now, this is important because it's pointing to the fact that when the beginning began, the word already was. He was there in the beginning. It's like the word became or came to exist. This takes us back all the way to the beginning, right? Not just to his gospel, but to Genesis, to the idea that when God created, the word already existed. So what is he doing here? He's telling us that he is preexistent, right? At this moment in time here, he's still not telling us much, but he's telling us that the word already existed in the beginning. The term was is the past tense of the verb to be. To be is what we call a state of verb. It, it tells you, it doesn't give you an action, but it tells you a condition or a state of something. So that's why we have to understand that it's not a action, it's telling you something about the word. So in this case, it's telling us about its condition, its, its state, right? That it always existed when the beginning began. The word is before all things. Now, when you read this, it takes you back to the exact words of Genesis, and that's what actually John is trying to do. He's taking us back all the way to Genesis in order to get us to understand that this word is going to be connected in some form, somehow, to God. Because in the beginning, what happened? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So not only, like I said, is he pointing us back to Genesis, he takes us further into eternity past. This beginning is the moment when energy, matter, space, and time literally begin. This word not only pre-existed before the creation, but the word was with God. So this is interesting to note too. It's not just existed, but was with God. There's a distinction that John is making here. He's trying to tell us something. This word that existed was with God. So we have a distinction here that he's going to connect with verse 3. In verse 3, he's going to tell us that the word was God. So how can the word be with God and be God at the same time? Because if you hear that, what comes to mind? Well, that's a contradiction. How can you be with something, with God, and be God at the same time? So this is pointing us back to eternity past where we see the personality of the logos, the word of God, who is always with God, toward God. It almost points to the idea of intimacy, that the Son which we're going to see in verse 14, is this word, and this word is facing God. In this case, we're talking about the Father. So the word was with God. And John is doing this very importantly. For what reason? Because John wants us to understand that when he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and word was God, 
that the word is not identical to God in terms of he's not the father. He's giving you a distinction. He's wanting you to know that the word that was is separate from the father, but he's not the father. So if you look at the order of the grammar, he helps us understand this. He doesn't write that the word was a God or that the word was the God. This is very important. That's why I said the grammar here can be a little tedious, but it's important to understand. He says the word was with God, not that the word was the God. Because if he said that the word was the God, he would say that the father and the son are the same person, which would introduce the heresy of modalism. And that's a problem. We can't have that. He doesn't write that the word was a God, because what would that do? That would give us Arianism, that there's a semi-created divine God, second to God, but there's only one God. The scriptures tell us there's only one God. So he tells us that the word was with God, and the word was God. He's giving us the idea that there is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together, but here, specifically talking about God and the Son, the Father. So God and his word are always together. Now, in this case, when you see this, we see that from the beginning, John wants you to understand and wants me to understand that this word is God himself. And this is important because I told you a while ago that when you're confronted with Jehovah Witnesses and anybody else, they will tell you that Jesus is not God, that he's a God. But the text doesn't make any provision for this. If we understand the text to say that, then there is no salvation. Athanasius would say that if Jesus is not God, you cannot be saved because you cannot have salvation through a third party. God is the offended party. God is the one that's been sinned against. So therefore, God alone is the only one who can forgive you. And God is the only one who can bear the burden. God is the only one who can forgive because he's the offended party. If Jesus was an angel as Arius taught or as... Um, Jehovah Witnesses teach, what would happen? You couldn't be saved. You need to go to the one who's, who you sinned against. That's why. Now, John is providing us with the categories of how to think correctly about God. We need to know that the word was with God and the word was God. As you move forward towards the council of not only Nicaea, which tells us that Jesus is God, in 451, you have the Council of Chalcedon. In the Council of Chalcedon, there we see this. Now, it reads <clears throat> interestingly here, but we need to understand this is exactly what John is telling us. As the people met, they were trying to make sure that they wouldn't conflate, they wouldn't mix, they wouldn't confuse who Jesus is. And so this is the creed that we get from the Council of Nicaea, or Council of Chalcedon. It says this, We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men, to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, of a rational soul and body, coessential with the Father according to the Godhead and consubstantial with us according to the manhood. So what is he saying there? He's of the same kind. He's fully human. He's fully God. Begotten before all the ages of the Father, according to the Godhead. And in these days, for us and our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, according to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. The distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved, the concurring in one person, the subsistence. So he's telling us this, this Jesus has to be God, but he's not the Father. So what we see here is this, to make it simpler, the theologian Fred Sanders gives us something called the Chalcedonian box, and this is what John is telling us, but in the Chalcedonian box, it gives us the parameters of how to think of God. So we have this four boxes, four sides of the box, if you will. Jesus is truly God, Jesus is truly man. Jesus is one person, and Jesus is two natures, has two natures. Why is this important? Well, it helps us avoid heresy. If we can affirm what the scriptures say, that Jesus is truly God, then we don't commit the heresy of Arianism, that we say that Jesus is not divine, that Jesus is not God. 
And if Jesus is not God, you can't be saved. Where do you see that, right? So the fact that Jesus is truly God shows us that he's divine and that we can be saved and avoids the heresy of Arianism. If we say that Jesus is truly human, we have to admit that because why did he become human? That's the whole point of the incarnation. He comes to be one of us. He has to be what we are, minus sin. That's the whole point of the incarnation. That's the whole point of coming. If he doesn't come and be one of us, then there can be no salvation. Because who sinned? We sinned. And that's why we find ourselves in the circumstance that we find ourselves in. And if humans sin, who has to fix the problem? A human does. But no mere human can fix the problem. So it has to be somebody, because we're united to Adam. There has to be somebody, the new Adam, Christ, who alone is God, but also is truly human, who will unite himself to us, or we will unite ourselves to him through faith by the Holy Spirit. So he has to be truly human, because if Jesus is not truly human, then you cannot be saved, and I cannot be saved. And this avoids the heresy of Apollinarianism, which teaches that Jesus was not truly human, but only two parts human. But Jesus has to be truly human in every aspect, or else we can't be saved. And the notion of these two natures, Jesus has to be truly God and truly human, because those are the natures that the scriptures give us. He's not one nature mixed together. He's not a third type of a thing. There's that connection that Jesus is the mediator between God and man, and he has to be both. Because only God alone can pay the price. Only God alone can sustain the wrath. And again, it's humans who have to pay that payment. And he's one person. There's not another person. There's only one person who exists in those two natures. So by staying within the walls of this four boxes, or the box with the four sides, we can avoid the heresies uh, that we talked about right now. Now in verse 3, it says that all things were made through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. Here John is telling us that Jesus, or the word, and i got to be careful with this because many times when we talk about Jesus, we talk about Jesus creating everything, and that's true. But at this moment in time, the word is the one who created. So it is true that the word is Jesus, but we got to be careful not to anachronistically speak. So we can say that, but technically speaking, before the word became one of us, he created. So Jesus wasn't up there and then he came down here. Jesus is the one who was born. Does that make sense? He's the, that's the human nature that the Logos took. So the Word is the agent of creation. He is the creator of everything and anything that exists and begins to exist. Now in the Old Testament, this points us back to the Word of God, which is active, powerful in creation. We see that in the Old Testament, where it says, God spoke and it was. We see that in Genesis, in Psalms, that when God speaks, things happen. God is speaking power. God is power. The word creates. When God speaks, things happen. God brings existence into being. God is existence in itself. The writer of Hebrews echoes John's words and connects us together and tells us that long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. So we see this notion of speaking. So communicating with his people and communicating with us. In these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The Son is the radiance and glory of, the, of God and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Now that's interesting right there. Not only does the Son or is the Son the agent of creation, the one through whom God creates and God speaks his word and things happen and God communicates to the old and to us now, but the word itself, not only by virtue of being creation and having life in himself, sustains everything. He is the glue that holds everything together. And he brought existence out of nothing, what they call ex nihilo. He created all that exists out of nothing. That shows you not only that the word creates, but that the word is extremely powerful, that is divine-like. And not only that does he create, but that, think about this. Nothing that exists can exist apart from him. The fact that you and I can breathe, the fact that you and I can have a heart beating, the fact that you and I are alive today means that he sustains us. In, in Colossians, it talks about how he is the glue that holds everything together. And apart from him, nothing can exist. And he created everything that begins to exist. Now, contrary to Jehovah's Witness teaching that the son was created 
the word was only an agent of creation, we know that the word was the agent of creation. Now think with me for a moment. When they tell you that, that the word was created, that, that Jesus was created, how could it be that the word created itself? Because it says there that he created all things and all things were made by him. So it wouldn't make sense to say that the word was created or created itself when it didn't exist. If it's the creating agent, that thing by which everything is created and everything by definition includes everything, and if the word was created or if Jesus was created as an angel, how could it create itself if it's that which creates everything because he would be part of everything? So when you start breaking it down, it makes no sense. We have to understand that he is the creator of the universe. So everything that begins to exist owes its existence to something else, something other than itself. In the physical sense, I owe my existence to my dad and my mom, and they owe theirs to their mom and their dad, and so on and so on. But ultimately speaking, God created all of humanity, and therefore we all owe our existence to him. And if that's the case, by way of application, what do we think about that? If God is creator, sustainer, then the question would be, are you and I living in a way that acknowledges him as creator, as sustainer, as God, the one who has all power and authority? That's something we need to consider. Because we can pay lip service to the fact that he is God, that he created us, right? We call him Father, but do we do what he says? He is our creator, our maker, and therefore we belong to him. Not only do we belong to him by virtue of being created, but the scripture tells us in Acts that God bought us with his blood. So we're his doubly. And he is our father if we are his children. So are you living in a manner that gives him glory as your God and creator? Now in verse 4 it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Here we understand that he is the very source of life. Nothing, again, that we said that came into being can be without him. Given that he is God and the source of life, We owe our existence, the very breath that you have to him. In John 14, 6, Jesus tells us, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you would have known my Father also. So he is the life. Life inheres in him. He is the very source of life. And so when we think about this, you and I are alive right now, physically speaking, because he is the source of life. He enables every heartbeat that you have, every breath that you take, every step that you take, every bite that you take. He enables you to have that. But in the same token, we are born physically, but we need a second birth because he said, the moment that you eat of it, you shall die. So we're born spiritually dead, dead on arrival. And as you start seeing John unpack this in John chapter 3, you see what he's telling Nicodemus, that you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God, to enter the kingdom of God. This is only an expansion of what we see in John chapter 1, verse 12, where he says that those who believed in him, he gave the right to become children of God who were born, not of the will of man or of the flesh or of blood, but they were born of God. So we see that we need to be born a second time or born from above spiritually because we're born dead. We're spiritually dead. And so because he is life, not only is he life, physical life, but spiritual life. And how can you have that spiritual life? Well, that's why he came, to be, so that we could be united to him. He became what we are minus sin so that we could become what he is by grace, sons of God. That life can only come from him. You also see this in John chapter 5, verses 26. He says, Verily, truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Now, thinking back again concerning verse 1, verse 2 that he is God, in verse 3, that he is the source of life. How could it be that a mere creation can be the source of life? It cannot be. God himself is life. And the fact that here Jesus tells us that he has been granted to have life in himself 
It's only an extension of what happens up there. When you consider the life of God before he comes to the world, this is what John is talking about, pre-existence. Now, John begins at the beginning. That's understood. But before the beginning, what was God doing? He was loving himself, right? The Father loving the Son through the Spirit, and the Son loving the Father through the Spirit in the unity of love. But before that, we see that the Son is eternally proceeding from the Father. The Son comes from the Father. God is a source. The Father is a source of the Son. The Son never begins to exist, but he has life because the Father has life. The Son is united to the Father in such a way that he has life in himself. So from all eternity, he's always had life. He is life itself. When he comes down, See, the Father and the Son, the Father sends the Son and the Spirit. They're coming down. They come to us. That's what's been happening in all eternity. The, Father, the Son comes from the Father from all eternity. It's what we call eternal generation. He's always coming from the Father. There never was a time when he wasn't, and when he wasn't proceeding from the Father. In the same way, that's the blueprint for what happens here. When he comes to earth, he's being sent. He's coming again from the Father. Jesus tells us this in John chapter 17. But he's coming, and he has with him life. And so when he tells us here that he has life in himself and that the Father has granted the Son to have life, well, he's only granting him to have what he already had. So what is true of there, he has it here as well. In the Son, there is life. Without the Son, there is no life. That's why John tells us elsewhere, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God doesn't have life. So again, what Jesus do you and I have? We have the true and living God, the true and living Jesus, who is the source of life. If you don't have Jesus, you cannot have life. He is a source of life. We need him for everything. As we move on to verse 14, here is where John essentially just, if you will, loses it and just lets go and he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Again, I keep mentioning this, this whole notion of the message of Christmas, not just Christmas, but for every day. The gospel, again, is not just for beginners. It's for all of us, all the step of the way. God is none other than the Son of God who came from the Father. It was the perfect time when he came. That's when he came, right? In Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, he tells us this. Paul tells us, he says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. You see what he did? God sent forth his Son. That's exactly what Jesus is tells us in John chapter 17, when the fullness of time had come, what is he talking about the fullness of time? What's the exact time that God had determined to send the Son? What is this time consist of? It consists of the Roman Empire holding control of the entire region, the Greek influence with the philosophy, the metaphysics, and you have the Jewish categories of the moral law and the glory of God. At the fullness of time, we have Not only the crucifixion, which was invented by the Medes and the Persians, but mastered by the Romans, that Jesus himself would come for that reason. He doesn't just come to live. He comes to die. He doesn't just come to die. He comes to rise again. The incarnation all points to this, and this is the reason for the coming again. So he says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. From eternity sends the son. Born of a woman, the incarnation. And I tell the youth group, incarnation, in the carne, in the meat, in the carne. So he's in the meat, right? Now, when we say that, be very careful to understand that Jesus, or the Word, the eternal Son of God, doesn't stop being who he was from all eternity. He's always been the eternal Son, God in the flesh. When he comes and becomes one of us, the idea is not of changing nature, but adding something to himself, something that he never was before. And that's where God himself is not afraid to get dirty He moves into the neighborhood. He takes on a human nature, like you and me, minus the sin. For what reason? To die for our sins. But not just to die for our sins, to show that he is the long-awaited one, the Messiah, the God who actually created you and me, the God who tabernacled in the wilderness. In fact, that's what the word means, to dwell. It literally means to pitch a tent. That's the word that he gives us in the Old Testament, when Israel was in the wilderness and he was pitching a tent. The idea of pitching a tent, you might think, well, we go camping and we pitch a tent, but we're only there for a little while. But that's not the idea here. The idea here is that he's pitching a tent to be close with us. Where did God meet with the Israelites before the temple? In the tent. That's where he met with them. 
And it's about holy space, proximity. That's the idea that we see here. So you see the son being towards the father, with the father, that intimacy. Now the son comes. And what does he come for? Not just to die and rise again, but to reveal the father, right? He's revealing the father. Jesus says, if you have seen me, you've seen the father. He reveals the father. He comes to be with us. So God himself come and dwells with us for a moment, at least at that time, and he will come again. So he's born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, which is us, so that we might receive adoption as sons. You know, the same word that uh, John uses here, he uses again in Revelation 21.3, and he says this, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place. Again, that's that same Greek word. God is dwelling with man. The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. It's interesting that he doesn't say we'll be up there with him. This is at the end, the eternal state, when he actually comes down again. Look at that. So he comes down the first time, full of grace and truth, revealing the glory of God. And again, think about this glory. What was the glory? The weightiness. The glory, the shining glory, the Shekinah of God that when they entered into the into the uh, Holy of Holies, you can see that glory. And you see Moses asking God, show me your glory. And God doesn't show him his glory, right? He hides him in the cleft because he can't see it. But all of a sudden, John here, he's telling us that God will dwell with us, pointing back not only to the tabernacle, not only to the cleft where God appears, if you will, and shows Moses' his back. But he actually, when Jesus comes, he reveals the Father's glory. But then when Jesus is transfigured and they see his glory... And now he's telling us that we have seen his glory. All of this pointing to the fact that God has come and is with us. And so, the dwelling place of God, he comes again, he will come again with us, to be with us forever. The whole idea of Jesus coming, the whole idea of the word becoming flesh is again to unite us to himself. We are in two stages. In the stage of Adam, or the life of Adam and the life of Jesus. Whoever is united to Adam is dead spiritually. Whoever is united to Christ has life. That's why he said, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So why did the Son come? Why did the Son come? To reveal the Father. Not just to reveal the Father, but to be one of us, to take our place, to do what we could not do, to fix the problem that we got ourselves into. God didn't have to do this, but he showed his love and his mercy. And that's why he says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this is the love that God shows us. So the whole idea of God coming is not just to be present, but to be present, to give life, to show himself. God is a giving God. He gives life. He gives of himself for you and for me. And that shows us something. He was full of grace and truth. So then the question we need to ask ourselves is, what can we do to think more about what we're talking about, to think more about what is this message about? What is Jesus about? We need to think about daily. We need to have the right Jesus. Jesus is God. Jesus is the creator. So then how do we get to know him? Well, the same way, to, the way, same way you get to know your spouse, the same way that you get to know your children, by spending time with them, right? By reading the scriptures, by spending time with him in prayer, but also by emulating him, right? Because Jesus says, if you call me Lord, do what I say. If you love me, you obey my commands. So do we love him? And in connecting this in some degree to the messages we've been hearing, are we being who Christ wants us to be? Are we doing what he wants us to do? Are we loving one another as he wants us to love one another? Are we holding our preferences above others? And it's interesting that he says grace and truth. You know, many times I learned this from a good friend of mine, and he reminds me of this about every time. And I thank him for this. And the idea is that many times we, we're good about sharing the truth, right? In fact, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about as we deal with Jehovah Witnesses and Muslim and Mormons is that we can share the truth, but we do so in an abrasive manner. We don't do so with grace. And either one is, an, is a problem, right? If you show too much kindness, you compromise truth. But if you're very blunt, and just share the truth and just demolish them with the truth and don't show grace, then how are we being Christ-like? 
So a method or an application we can understand from this is that Jesus himself, think about this, in Philippians 2, he comes down, right? Again, you see this from beginning to end, that he comes down, being God, doesn't consider equality with God something to be grasped on, something to take credit for. He is God, but yet he comes and gets dirty and is humble and is able to share that grace and truth even when he was maltreated, even when he was treated like dirt. And we can learn from that, that we are to be like Jesus, to have the mind of Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. And so as we wrap this up, we see that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This God himself is the truth, is the source of life, is the Son, the eternal Son who came to be one of us so that we could be one of him. By that I mean sons of God. He gives us life. This gospel message is not just for today or for yesterday. It's for every day. We would do well to remember what the purpose of his coming was for, right? That we were sinners, haters of God, lost, but yet he himself went to the cross, humbled himself, died the death, not just a death, but the death, the worst kind of a death, so that you and I can have life. And he chose us in him before the creation, foundation of the world that we'd be holy and blameless. Can we do that? So as we conclude, I want us just to think of this. Make sure that you have the right Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus who is God, who John tells us is God, who was with God, the second person of the Trinity, the source of life. Because Jesus is God and your creator, are you and I living as if he's my creator and my God? And just think of what Pastor Brian preached not too long ago about the omniscience of God and the omnipresence of God. Are we living in a way that glorifies him when nobody's watching? He knows everything. He sees everything. He knows what you're going to do before you do it and before you say it. So are you and I living as if he's God and my creator? Are you and I spending time in his written word so that we can get the, know, to know the incarnate word who lives in us now through the spirit so that we can love him better and love others better? And are we being gracious, never compromising the truth, but also speaking the truth in grace? I'll leave you with that. There's so much more that could be said in fact, my mind was going uh, everywhere and thinking about where we're going to go with this um, when I was writing this. But um, let's think about that and remember that Jesus came, that we may have life, and to reveal the Father, that we may become children of God. But all the grace, all the glory goes to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> thank you, Lord, for giving us this time. Thank you for enabling us to be here together, to be able to hear that you came to be one of us, Lord, that you were not afraid to get dirty, that you came, that you did what was unexpected, that you entered your own creation, that through Jesus, you show us how to be, you show us true humanity. You, Lord, came into your creation, shows us your love. It points us to the cross, and it points us to the resurrection, Lord. This is just the beginning. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, and we ask you to fill us with your love. Lord, help us live a way that glorifies you. Help us uh, think of your truth. Think, help us think of your grace. Lord, help us um, obey your commands, Lord. Help us be gracious when we share the truth, Lord, and help us never compromise the truth, Lord. And help us understand, Lord, that because you are for us, it doesn't matter what other people think of us. We don't have to perform for them that we can be confident, Lord, knowing that you love us and that you accept us and that in Christ we have life. Lord, if there's anybody here who doesn't know you, Lord, I pray, Lord, that they would come to know you. I pray that you would work in their hearts, open their hearts and their minds, Lord, and give them, grant them repentance, Lord, that they may come to you, Lord, and be saved. And for those who do know you, Lord, I pray, Father, that you would bless them. And Lord, even for those who are going to get baptized today, Lord, continually bless them and remind them, Lord, that you are their Savior, you are their God and that you care for them, and that you came to die for them and rise again, Lord, that they may have life and have it to the fullest. We thank you, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
of man, it seems there's so much we have lost. As we look down the road where all the prodigals have walked, and one by one the enemy has whispered lies and led them off as slaves. Now, when we baptize, we want to make sure, like communion, that we always explain what we're doing. So that way, those of you that aren't familiar with baptism know what you're observing. Baptism is several things. In Scripture, we see that it's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so as one stands on the water and then goes under and comes back, it's picturing the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It also pictures a spiritual transformation that 
the old person that did not love God, did not, that did not believe the gospel, that person is so united with Christ that his death was the death of their old self. That old person that didn't want to obey God is dead and buried. And the new person is brought up, spiritually speaking, um, and they're walking in newness of life. And so the person who's being baptized has experienced a spiritual resurrection as they await their physical death and then physical resurrection. So they've experienced salvation in part and are waiting for further salvation. Baptism also, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20, when he tells us to go into the world and preach the gospel, he says to make disciples. And he says that we are to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there's that idea of one God, the name, and then the Father, Son, and Spirit. We see that plurality as pastor, uh, pastor sorry, one day, all right, uh, Brother Carlos Pamplona was speaking about that there is one God who exists in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we baptize that person as a disciple of Christ. It is their way of telling everyone, I am a follower of Christ. Uh, I need discipleship, and I'm willing to follow Christ by those who teach me how to follow Christ as they teach me the word. And so baptism pictures all of this and represents all of this as it does picture the washing away of our sins. And so this morning, uh, we have three baptisms. Uh, these are brothers and sisters in Christ that confess that Jesus is Lord and they believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead. Now, all that to say, they have repented of their sin and they put their faith in Jesus Christ. And so the first one up is Jacob Daniels. All right, everyone, this is Jacob. This is Jesse and Bernadette's son, all right, the Lee's son, so, and Hannah's brother, all right? All right, two, <laughs> say hi back, man. All right, <laughs> she said hi. All right, so Jacob, I have two questions for you, brother. Uh, the first one is this, have you repented of your sin and do you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? Yes, absolutely. Amen, and have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he was crucified, buried, and risen again for your sins? 100%. Amen, then on your profession of faith in Christ, I baptize you my brother in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen, brother. Thank you. Congratulations. Yep. All right. All right. Yep. Next we have Joanna Mejia. Yes. All right. We're about to sing Take My Breath Away. All right, this is Joanna Mejia. I have the same questions for you, sister. Do you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and have you repented of your sin? Yes. And do you believe that Christ was crucified, buried, and risen again for your sins and have you put your trust in him to save you? Yes. Then I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. This is Lenny Crespo. I've known Lenny since she was uh, in a little cradle chair uh, sucking on a bottle. She, uh, so I've known her longer than she's known me. And uh, it's my privilege to baptize my young sister and uh, the child of my dear friends. Lenny, two questions for you, sister. And uh, but this is Jeff, by the way. He's one of our youth leaders. Okay, um, Lenny, two questions. Have you repented of your sin? And do you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? I do. Amen. And then also, have you put your faith in Jesus Christ, and do you believe that he was crucified, buried, and risen again for your sins? Mm -hmm. Amen. Then on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, my sister, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. It's cold. <laughs> it is cold. 
All right. Now at this time we'll be receiving communion. We've already given the warning uh, for communion. Pastor Brian will lead us in communion, and we'll be taking communion in the back here with our brothers and our sisters who were just baptized. Thank you, Pastor Brian. All right. Well, let us pray one more time about this. Father in heaven, we are just so grateful to see these examples of, of death to life, Lord. Give us these things to remember, to remember when we're in times of struggle about our faith, if we think our, tra- our faith is true, but we know it is true. We know we have a God who is bigger than us, that knows our hearts, and that changes hearts, and brings us to life, even at times when we feel like we are maybe in states of death, Lord. And so, just thank you for this time of celebration, Lord, and with that, we will now partake in the next greatest part of this, is the communion pieces. Those that now have identify with Christ, they now take the blood and the body together, Lord, to, um, to commemorate and to uh, signify of what he's done for us. In your name we pray, amen. So I'll be reading from Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. And it says, when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took bread. So let's take the bread. He gave thanks, and he broke it. He gave it to them and said, This is my body for which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But look, look at the hand when one betrayed me is at the table with me. For the Son of Man will go away as has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Let us take. Father, again, we thank you for this time, Lord. Thank you to be able to celebrate in this uh, means of grace for us as we continue on. Uh, as the kingdom grows and you add more and more believers that come and they get to experience to go from death to life, Lord. So for that, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Steve. Good morning. At, wow. At this time, we were going to dismiss the young ones so that they could be picked up at, by their parents. And please don't forget to pick them up. Um, as they're walking out, most of you are probably wondering, who is this guy? You know, I'm relatively new here. My name's Steve Chavez, and Brother Carlos, I too was born a Mexican. I'm going to die a Mexican. I was born Catholic, and praise God, like you, I'm going to be died glorified. So, yes, uh, there are certain things that are kind of interesting, and I'm sure you're all saying, yeah, sure he's a Mexican, right? <laughs> All right, so let's, let's pray, will you? Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this message, Lord, of, of your incarnation and how you came and saved us and how you were before the foundation of time and you created everything, Lord. And we pray that you will just help us to apply this to our lives as we go through our work, our week this week, Lord, and help us to love each other as you have loved us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I was instructed to give the benediction and just to give you an idea of how God works, I was meditating on 1 John chapter uh, 1, verses 1 through 4, because that's what I was told it was about. And as Brother Carlos was preaching on John chapter 1, I frantically was looking at my notes and realized the benediction was very appropriate, even though I picked a benediction out of 1 John. But uh, it, it's kind of interesting, because I've been reading in my personal time through the prophets, and a lot of the things that have happened with the, prof- the children of Israel was due to idolatry. And idolatry is more than just bowing down to an image. It is putting yourself higher than God. So as we think about that, Brother Carlos asked a question. Are you living in a manner that glorify- gives glory to God? So think about that as we read 1 John chapter 5, 20 and 21. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him and who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his, his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. 
Little children, keep yourselves from idols. So to use a Pauline phrase, therefore, go out this week and serve the family of God by worshiping the Son of Jesus Christ. He is the true God. You are dismissed.